Hello, and welcome to the launch of Thresholds issue number 48, KIN. My name is Timothy Hyde. I'm on the faculty in the Department of Architecture, and I'm also the faculty advisor for the journal Thresholds. Thresholds is a journal published each year by the Department of Architecture, edited each year by a new group of student editors. The journal has been published for about 30 years now, first beginning as a monthly zine, but then soon becoming an annual issue organized around a particular theme that's chosen and conceived and conceptualized by the student editors. The magazine typically publishes a range of contributions from scholars around the world. The scholarship includes architectural history, architectural theory, art history, also design contributions and media arts contributions, all chosen to reflect upon and to analyze and to put forward a particular interpretation of the theme chosen by the student's editors. This year's issue is on the theme of kin, an issue that always had broad relevance and interest, but of course over the past few months has taken on a particularly, particularly new valence and a particularly new understanding, relevance, and sensibility for all of us. And the student editors and contributors will help you reflect upon that relevance tonight. My job simply is to introduce those editors and also just to give a bit of thanks for the larger cohort within the school that helps produce the journal. So first of all, thanks to the Dean of the School of Architecture and Planning, Dean Hashem Sarkis, and the head of the Department of Architecture, Andrew Scott, both of whom supported this issue of Thresholds just as they've supported many issues in the past. I'd also like to thank the advisory board for Thresholds, a very active advisory board that gives perspective on the journal um, as both former editors in some cases, but as leading scholars uh, and leading editors themselves. Within the school, we're also very lucky to have a relationship with MIT Press, which distributes the journal Thresholds, uh, but also helps in aspects of its production and we're very grateful to them, uh, particularly with this issue, given that we have to release the issue digitally before we can distribute to all of you uh, potential uh, distribute to all of you the, the uh, print issues. And then also within the school, Amanda Moore and Melissa Vaughn have been instrumental in producing, helping the student editors produce this issue, just as they've produced all the rest. As I said, uh, my job is simply to introduce you to and hand you over to the uh, intellectual minds behind this particular issue who will give you some sense of why the issue and the, the thinking around kin has become more pressing uh, than we realized it was even just a few short months ago. So with my thanks to them as well for uh, an immense amount of work, an immense amount of intellectual creativity, and for really a fabulous issue of the journal Thresholds, uh, let me hand it over to Stratton Kaufman, Dalma Foldesi, and Sarah Wagner. Thank you, Timothy. Um, and we also want to add on our own string of thanks uh, to the many people who have helped make this issue possible, to Laura, our graphic designer, Irina and Amanda for their backstage support, Patsy and Kelsey for editorial assistance, Anne and Melissa at MIT Press, to you, Timothy, of course, our advisor, um, to Sarah and Walker, our predecessors, and to Nina and Jack, who are now editing the next issue, Thresholds 49 Supply. Um, and then, of course, to all of our contributors and all of our anonymous peers. We anticipate printing during the summer, so stay tuned. If you're interested in browsing the issue during or after this conversation, we would direct you to the Thresholds to thresholds on the MIT Press website, where you can order print and digital issues and read our extended introduction. We find the topic of our conversation, Kin, to have new and salient resonance in this moment of COVID-19 as we put our relational existence to the test, both in our personal lives and at a global scale. Existing systems of exclusion, neglect, and containment have been made more evident, and yet our emergency state suggests these structures are shifting under pressures. While this Zoom gathering is not the in-person launch we originally had in mind, it is exceptional that we can bring together in real time the voices of all but one of our contributors. Um, so thanks everyone for being here and here and there and here. <laughs> um, 
the entries in this issue um, together stake out this zone of um, transfusion or meeting and swapping between, um, on the one hand, anthropological theories of kinship and on the other, histories of art and architectural subjects. Um, so we see in this issue, um, we see the issue as an enlargening of disciplinary tense um, to build greater room and counteract the flattening tendencies or sort of the abstraction of relations um, that have been endemic to these various disciplines, anthropology, art history, architectural discourse, and adjacent ones. Um, so we think that the issue is sort of an invitation to attend to, um, on the one hand, the spatial dimensions of anthropological accounts of kinship to sort of disaggregate diagrams of relations like family trees and bloodlines, or even sort of systems of exclusion like redlining, um, to begin to show us um, to be ever within a shared duration that such diagrams or schemas tend to collapse or sort of atomize. Um, and likewise, in the inverse direction, um, the care of ethnographic work helps inject into the often abstracting rubrics of architectural thought um, a language of difference, um, as well as tools for tracing the sort of fluid dynamics of power that um, form the subjects that populate art and architecture. I know that while this is a simplified schema uh, of the contributions and of the journal's ambition, um, this is also one that we're sure that the following readings will begin to erode, sort of rework and rearrange. And the contributions bring to light this overlooked nexus of scholarship and propose a collective rewriting of the spatiality and politics of kinship. And we as editors, Stratzer and I, decline to label each section in the journal. And instead, we turn to the pieces that pieces in the journal that defy scholarly categories to bridge between essays that form cozier clusters. And these transitional pieces, um, the pieces that are printed with a black background in the journal, if you've had a chance to look at it, um, play these threads um, of the thematic groupings into non-traditional forms, um, from a manifesto to an experimental ethnography, for example. And the pieces in each section voice arguments from a broad range of disciplines, time periods, um, subjectivities, um, proposing a diversity of critical takes on what constitutes spatial practice and expanding that notion. And today, during this event, we hope to erode our own categories, um, even though unlabeled, in a format that allows authors from different sections in the journal to get together, um, to talk to each other, and so we're reshuffling the journal, the journal's print order, um, and we're spawning new connections. And with that, we would like to invite our fantastic graphic designer, Laura, to introduce the journal's design and layout. And after Laura, we'll introduce tonight's format in more detail. Thank you, Thelma. Um, my name is Laura, and I'm an artist and designer living in New Haven. Um, my practice is uh, multidisciplinary and encompasses print, web, video, and other platforms expanded the concept of reading to include broader multisensory experiences. Um, and Kin's early conceptual phase relied on the idea of kin as wayfinding and navigation, an idea of moving together through space and moving together through this book. Um, and we brought forward pieces that for us ex express a defiance of hierarchy between writing and marginalia, and we made those pieces black and inter in, sorry, interspersed them with pieces that other that fit very well within the format of an academic journal. Um, the journal uses th these interludes to guide the reader through the physical book. Other solutions, such as having a consistent horizon line throughout the journal, titles that lead onto the opposite folio, windows that allow for images to be seen through paper, create visual incentives for the reader to move through the physical space of the book um, and incite exploration from piece to piece. Um, also, the table of contents highlights the interconnectedness and natural entanglement of interest, areas of research, tone or perspective between the authors within the issue. Um, and lastly, I, I just wanted to mention that the hand is very important to us and it was present through these very expressive moments in the table of contents and also throughout 
typographic choices in the issue. Thank you. All right, so um, to introduce the format for this launch, we have asked all of our contributors to read one other piece in the issue and to extract a brief excerpt and draft a response to it. With the exception of one cancellation, all of our authors are able to be present, which is wonderful. Um, since Nasser Rabat will not be able to join us, F Architecture will also present their own piece. The order of the presentations won't follow the um, structure of the journal, but instead proposes an alternative chain of connections between the pieces. So each author will be reading the piece of the subsequent author until at the very end we loop back around. So um, we will begin first actually with uh, Nana Last, who will be presenting Gilding Our Ghosts by Ben and Sebastian. Hi everyone, I'm Nana Last, uh, as was said, I'm um, an associate professor at the Department of Architecture at UVA. And the piece I have in the um, volume is entitled Thomas Struth's Bodies of Work. So today I have this um, fun project to um, present. It's called Gilding Our Ghosts by Ben and Sebastian. And I'm gonna start with the, well, I'll give you the little um, summary first. Gilding the Ghost is an experimental art project that combines a stage by stage, bodily organ by bodily organ description of a 19th century gilded pills, undissolved trip through the digestive trap, trap, track. And this is interspersed with short descriptions of the materials, quotations about such constructs as the frame, the archive, traces, prosthetics, and images and captions of an earlier art installation by the artist engaged with this set of ideas and processes. So the reading I'm going to give on uh, the expert excerpt is actually the opening of it because I think it sets up best an understanding of what this is. It begins with mouth. Open wide, says the doctor. We gazed at flakes of gold in a vessel and a small perfect sphere the 19th century gilding bowl and pill displayed at the Medical Museum in Copenhagen. In the early days of modern pharmacology, wealthier patients would have pills gilded in order to cover the taste of the medicine and make them look more attractive. The gilded pill would pass through the body undigested, making it available for reuse. One pill could serve entire families, passing through one body to the next. The golden pill is a placebo par excellence. The brilliance of its shell is, is designed to please the eye while simultaneously sealing it away, sealing away the pill's contents and blocking them from having any physiological interaction with the patient's body, or for that matter, with the child or grandchild. An edible heirloom, ma made valuable not only by the gold layer, but also by its close contact with familial extensions of the self and a gleaming bit to dig out of the ancestral ship. That's the end of the excerpt. I think it really sets up well. It gives you a sense what this piece is like. They're all sort of titled with these different body parts and this interspersed. And just a couple of reflections on it. Um, the project really makes me think about the materiality of kin, its physical, social, and practical aspects, and how they're formed over time as a process that acts in and through bodies of various sort a process that entails any number of frames, spaces, and institutions that come to act together, even if they at times seem uninflected by one another. The material concepts of the process, trace and frame, stand out in this discussion. As the title, Gilding Our Ghosts, suggests, there is a haunting that underlies this work as it moves on from one passage, one stage of digestion, one body part, one material manifestation, site or institution, and voice, and on to the next. The focus on the gilded pill acts sort of like a camera that can record the stages of this process, entering into it as a critical element that activates this historical trace. Yet in some ways, it is also distinct from it. This quality allows it to be a trace which like kin occupies the past, present and future. Do I? introduce the next person or? Yes, that would be great, thank you. Okay, sorry, I have to look <laughs> at my list. Okay, so the next people um, 
that are presenting are Ben and Sebastian, and they will be presenting um, the work from Ivan Yunera, who I'm probably mispronouncing and I don't have the title of the piece, but. So thank you very much, Nana. We are Ben and Sebastian, and we wrote the piece Gilding Our Ghost that Nana Last has just introduced. We're a visual artist duo interested in how gaps in knowledge shape identity and how particular absences in the form of lost objects, incomplete artifacts, or excluded voices act upon the imagination. So we're going to be reading from Ivan Munera's text, HIV and AIDS Kin, The Discotecture of Paradise Garage, which looks at forms of kinship with within and between the ostracized groups first afflicted by the HIV and AIDS pandemic in the early 80s. And it's doing this specifically at the Paradise Garage, a lower Manhattan nightclub, also known as the Paradise Gay Rage, because of the political engagement of its queer community. This form of kinship, Nuera writes, was not based in the traditional understanding of lineage, consanguinity, phylogenetic relationships, traditional family structures, but in the way they engaged with a virus, HIV, and a disease, AIDS, through their activism. HIV was the biological agent that allowed kinship to form among its carriers, acting as both kin and apparatus by which kin was created. But these ties were not only biological, they were also social and political. Not all the people involved in this kinship carried the virus or shared the same positive status. And even if they shared it, there were multiple thresholds in the viral load. Undetectables, HIV positive with no AIDS, false positives, etc. So later in the text, uh, Munoera continues. Instead of being located in specific spaces, discos, saunas, bathhouses, the subjects affected by the epidemic carried in their own bodies and actions a new urban conception. A microbiological and performative urbanism that first emerged in discotecture was redefined beyond the limits of the club, even beyond the infrastructural extents of the city. In 1987, the United States approved a travel ban for people who had tested positive for HIV. From 1987 to 2010, people living with HIV and AIDS who traveled to the United States embodied the borders, legislations, and regulations of the government. So though Munoera's text was written before the coronavirus spread across the globe, it clearly resonates with questions we're facing now in relation to the current pandemic. Philosopher and trans activist Paul Preciado has written recently on the shared common Latin root, munus, in the words community and immunity, meaning the duty someone must pay to be part of a social group. Immunity under Roman law was an exemption from that duty, whereas community would be paying it, bearing with it. Pandemics provoke a biologic, bio, <laughs> pandemics provoke a biopolitical struggle of immunity and community in which our vulnerable bodies are at stake. And as seen in the current corona crisis, community has the positive potential of solidarity. But coupled with ideas of privileged immunity, we face the real risk of creating new class divisions on top of strengthening existing ones. Paradise Garage was a place where the battle was raging on both a viral and social level. Community politics sought safety in sticking together, while immunity politics sought protections by creating physical division and social distancing. So to end on a personal note in relation to our own work, we've been particularly interested in the article's focus on what gaps in knowledge create how beliefs and psychological spaces pass from one body to another and in the absence of a coherent narrative, as arguably we have now. And 
we'll hand over. I'm afraid we might need help for we'll who to hand over to. Well, we'll, next we'll hand over to Ivan, I guess. <laughs> yes. So yes. That is, it is will it. follow. <laughs> That's just a chain of yeah. okay. leading in Thank contribution. You. Thank you. Well, first, uh, many thanks. It has been uh, fantastic. And I really love this uh, kind of promiscuity, uh, let's say. Um, at least I, I think that we will dance again, uh, even if it's like through our screens. So I'm Ivan Monuera, a New York-based uh, scholar, critique, and curator, uh, working at the intersection of culture, technology, politics, and bodily practices in the modern period and on the global stage. Today, I'm presenting Cow, Kant, Creep toward a trans species anti-ableist feminism by Emily Watlington, assistant editor at Art in America. In this essay, Watlington proposes an activist way of understanding a trans species kinship based on an intersectional methodology that brings together feminism, creep studies, and post-human approaches. So uh, the excerpt uh, that I'm reading is from page 173, and it goes, women and non-human animals have been likened to prove their twin inferiority. Aristotle compared women to animals in order to illustrate that both lack capacity for moral thought Spinoza remarked that advocacy against animal slaughter was based on superstition and womanish pity, rather than on reason. Our conceptions of agency and self-determination are often speciesist and misogynistic, and accordingly, the liberation of animals and women are deeply entangled. We can't liberate one without the other. For me, this excerpt highlights the common struggle of marginalized actors, thus their shared activism. It confronts our conceptions of what animals are able to do, are able to signify, and how these epistemologies are based on how they conform to ableist and patriarchal understandings of agency. Meanwhile, Watlington proposes a liberation front, a trans species parliament that doesn't exclude animals from the equation of a joint battleground. Chastising one population to lift up another does not end oppression. So animals, creeps, women, and by extension, all humans and non-humans, let's form another kinship let's fight together against the patriarchal ableist regime. And uh, let me introduce you, Emily Watlington, that uh, she's going to uh, read an excerpt from Tiago Manucci. Thank you so much for your generous reading, Ivan. Um, and thanks everyone for having me both uh, in the issue at, and at this event. Um, yeah, I'm Emily Watlington. Uh, I graduated from MIT Architecture two years ago in the History, Theory, and Criticism group. Um, and I'm now at Art in America, where I'm an editor. And yes, I'm going to read from Tiago Benucci's essay called An Armadillo Spirit Built a House Inside My Chest the Size of a Mountain. Tiago is both an architect and an anthropologist. So um, this makes for a really uh, interesting uh, experimental piece, which is a dialogue between indigenous leaders in the Amazon, and it's based on oral histories, uh, but presented in English and in a rather poetic way. It's set in the wake of the destruction of the Amazon, and it's laid out in such a way um, that it's implied that there are two speakers, so perhaps they represent um, more voices. Um, so one speaker on one side, and then there's another speaker on the other like this. Uh, one speaker says, uh, this is an excerpt from toward the end, the house is a mountain and the spirits live inside it. That is why they become furious when the Nape, that's white people, destroy their home. Um, then the other side replies, illegal mining, mining at all, agriculture, livestock, deforestation, big infrastructures and development projects, highways, tunnels. And then the first speaker, all of this, all of this destroys the spirits houses, paths and clearings. 
they live as we live. They have fire, they hunt, they cultivate gardens. That is why the shamans teach us to teach the others, to not let the others ruin their houses. This ground, the earth, right here where we are right now, this is the sky that fell down in ancient times. It was the sky of the ancient people and they are our ancestors. That sky up there, we know it. It can fall anytime. The shamans and the spirits already know where the holes are, big holes in the middle of the clouds near the borders of the sky. They can cut the sky if they become angry or they can hold it. But if they destroy all of us, the shamans will not sing anymore. They will not dance anymore. The spirits will get angry and the dangerous spirits will be uncontrolled. They will not dance to hold the sky anymore and they will fall. That is how it is. That is how I learned it. And that is what I'm telling you. Um, there's so many like rich threads I could pull from this passage, but uh, one that stood out um, in thinking about how it might relate to architecture, it struck me that it uh, highlights the relationship between building and destroying. And it provides a way to rethink about the term built environment to mean um, not just a home built by a human being, but also the earth as our home. Um, so in a footnote, Tiago replies, uh, it's more than time to seriously listen to our necessary allies whose words already ended and whose sky has already fallen. The game is not over, but the sky is already falling. Uh, yeah, so I'll hand it over to Tiago, thank you. Thank you, Emily. Uh, it was really nice to, to listen to you <laughs> commenting the, this essay. Uh, so as you said, I am an architect and also an anthropologist. I'm based in Sao Paulo, uh, and I have been working with the Yanomami people of Amazonia, Northern Brazil since 2016. Uh, and, well, and today the piece I will briefly present here uh, is the paper written by Irene Brisson, Irene Brisson, called Damage and Repair, Imagining Collective Dwelling in Rural Haiti. Hai, here we call Haiti. <laughs> in English, I don't know how to say it very well. <laughs> uh, well the, piece, the piece presents the highly complex political, anthropological, and metaphysical background that originated the proposal of the Workers' Repatriation Center of Haiti, as well as the details of the design, conception, and its main ideas, which was developed by one anthropologist and one architect also, which is an interesting combination <laughs> for me as well. Uh, and to begin my brief commentary about the paper, uh, I will read an excerpt uh, of the piece, which I think synthesizes the complexity involved in the political and architectural proposal of the Workers' Repatriation Center of Haiti. So the proposed imagined as a collective utopia, as an act of resistance against persistent forces, dehumanization and alienation, imperialism and migration, necropolitical violence and disenfranchisement. The center and the lacou for ground collective living as critical spatial practices within a voodoo metaphysics, metaphysics but establish relationships on different criteria. The built environment cannot repair social relationships, but the collectivity rhetorically centered in these spatial practices offered at least a dream of repatriation that moves the impossible into the realm of the imaginable. So that's the end of the quote. Uh, and after this, Synthetical overview, I would like to highlight the present paper uh, as a great opportunity, I think, to see how can architectural design, as the described example of the Workers' Repatriation Center, can get together different disciplines, such as architecture and anthropology, uh, in the development of a concrete proposal, thus as a critical reading of traditional practices and also Metaphysics, metaphysical concepts. Uh, the, the paper to me uh, describes a complex and also a inspiring way uh, of, as the author says, how to move critic 
into transformative design, which I think is a, it's a, a challenge that we, we experience all the time. Uh, and this critical spatial practices, for instance, includes an interesting reading of counterplantation practices uh, in Haiti, and also forms of collectives to resist the oppressive structures of a neoliberal world order. And as I would like to propose, also an inspiring way to think of a concrete decolonial practice of architecture. And that's it. Thank you very much. And now we will listen to Irene Brisson. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much um, for that really beautiful reading. Um, so I'm Irene Brisson, Irene Brisson. I respond to them all. Um, a doctoral candidate at the University of Michigan, uh, where I'm working on an ethno-historical study of residential architecture in Haiti or IT. And um, I thought also something that informed my response to this piece is that sometimes I've also been a dancer um, and tried to leave architecture uh, several times for performance studies. And I keep getting pulled back in because I think as Malcolm's piece I'm gonna talk about demonstrates architecture and performance feedback with each other and really really potent ways. So I'm responding to Architecture is Burning, an Urbanism of Queer Kinship and Ballroom Culture by Malcolm Rio. So Malcolm argues for the importance of developing frameworks and methodologies for architectural histories, theories that can apprehend people and practices that have long been excluded. He uses oral histories and film to write about queer people of color and participants in New York City's ballroom scene ballroom culture created safe spaces through social relationship and ephemeral events that supported queer people of color who've had to cons constantly adapt to adverse conditions and do so through creative and opportunistic distortions of architectural space. And I thought really the best summary was one of his subheadings, quote, locating the ballroom, ordinary spaces of spectacular performances. So I'm gonna read uh, two excerpts from separate places, but um, quote, the foundation of every house is the desire to support and love fellow house members and remove them from close proximity with the urban crises in their everyday life. Both Freddie and Angie make clear that biology does not determine the form of kinship, but rather the rituals of support and care. Ballroom subverts the tools of architecture and organizational legitimacy, carving out spaces for the enactment and celebration of Black queer life, joy, and fabulosity through destabilizing mimetic practices. So I was really excited to be assigned this piece. Um, for one thing, I'm calling it from Detroit, um, which is the site of one of the, I think, key references, Marlon Bailey's work on the ethnography of the Detroit ballroom scene but also because of the continuity, I think, between the alternative kinship formations, um, literally called houses, right, and balls, and that of members of named Laku, or, which are spiritual houses, which is really a topic that was basically relegated to the footnotes of my piece because it was just too much um, to take on. But um, in some sort of resonant, parallelism, members of a spiritual lack who might come together in ritual through dance, and people can move in ways that can be really drastically unlike their ordinary comportment, either in performance or in a sort of spiritual um, mounting is the word. I don't, can't quite translate the concept right now. Um, but the both lack who certain Laku and, and these ball houses have a space for fluidity and gender performance that I think is quite interesting. And so there was this unintended segue, I think, uh, where my last footnote on the page prior to um, Malcolm's article references the performance and gender scholar Mario Lamoth, who wrote, quote, we cherish the Creole pronoun nu, or we, because the Haitian does not breathe, speak, walk, dance, love, mourn, or transition alone. Um, and this comes out of his piece um, on gay men's stories of violence and hope in Haiti. And so here and elsewhere, he writes about queer masculinities and how they're performed in Haitian folklore, um, including an idea of de double or doubling, uh, which can manifest in performing other aspects of gender or sexuality um, 
that I think Alchemy might find really interesting. So I think this collective we uh, is a recurring theme throughout this issue, of course, um, since it's really core to formulating kinship. Um, but the themes and characters of this piece, uh, which I would identify as kind of oppression and marginalization, um, sickness, forms of HIV and drug addiction in the 70s and 80s in New York City, um, kind of hang, hang together with the power and the joy of the, the ballroom community, being able to do this architectural practice of like sliding into places and putting up, you know, bright and light decorations to temporarily create spectacular places where people belonged. Um, and I was really struck by the importance of retelling these stories to ensure that more people know that these spaces are possible and have existed and that they keep on existing um, for, you know, for complex overlapping good and bad reasons. Um, and that because we're, I think, especially at this time of global crisis, really in need of spaces that are structured by rituals of care and support, which is the sort of the definition of, of kinship that I read in this piece. And, um, I wanted to close that while I was reading this, I was also thinking very much about stance historian Tommy de France, um, who was at MIT a long time ago or a while ago, um, who's written about black social dance. And he wrote um, about bone breaking, quote, we pause and hold our breath as the subject demonstrates other ways to be physically in the world. We vogue, we bone break, we dance to demonstrate our protest to the assumption of a unified subject, quote. And so I think my closing observation is that I think Rio begins to show us in this piece how ballroom houses made architecture that protested the assumption of a unified subject and demonstrate quote, other ways to physically be in the world. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for a beautiful summary. Hello. My name is Malcolm Rio, he, him, his. Uh, like Emily, I also graduated from MIT SMART's uh, program, but now I'm a first year PhD student in architectural history at Columbia, um, who works on the intersections of race, sexuality, and colonial urbanism, among other things. I'll be reading a short excerpt from Yvonne Dizdar, or sorry, Ivana Dizdar's essay, He Loves Me Not, Marriage and Migration in the Work of Tanya Auswich. To briefly summarize the article, through the performance art of Auschwitz, Dizdar argues that contemporary European systems of migratory control are an extension of Europeans' colonial past. By placing an ad for the literal sale of her own body, an exchange between marriage and its associative expectations in return for EU citizenship, Auschwitz exposes the troubling legal and social apparatuses used by the EU to sanction or exclude kinship formations. The following is from Dizdar's essay on page 56. Quote, whether deliberately or not, the ad draws a visual and conceptual link between the activities of the European Union and colonial practice. Historically, colonialism involves the examination of bodies dimensions, difference, and behavior in relation to the Western European exemplar. Similarly, EU participation entails the detailed examination of the candidate countries, its parts or citizens, and the ways they function. Auschwitz becomes, uh, Auschwitz becomes a metaphor for Serbia as potential husbands, EU citizens, are given access to her anatomy and permitted to examine the way she functions. Two, the artist's body, first self-disseminated online and later self-subjected to the collective gaze in physical public space during her performance, is not only a component of her application for EU citizenship, but also a metaphor for the demands placed on EU candidate countries, such as her own, to sell themselves in order to attain superior social, political, and legal status. Selling, uh, selling oneself is no easy task, given the EU's anti-immigration attitude, rhetoric against multiculturalism, and religious diversification, and racially and ethnically charged policies and laws. Ironically, the year Auschwitz initiated her project in the European Union, adopt, the European Union adopted the motto, unity in diversity. A decade later, the EU would become the recipient of a Nobel Peace Prize." End quote. 
Auschwitz performance points to what forms of kinship can be officialized, recognized, and even celebrated as a form of political and social tolerance. Through the frame of heterosexual wedlock, what Dizdar also points to as, quote, the cult of the family, and taking from Engels the origin of the family, despite all its inaccuracies, what could also be referred to as, quote, the cult of patriarchal monogamy, Auschwitz obtains EU citizenship, EU kinship. For me, two questions emerge. What of non-heterosexual marriage, which is acknowledged by some member states, but not all, keeping in mind that this work of art occurred before the ECJ's 2018 ruling? How does this extension or extended hand uh, to the homosexual family figure into systems of migratory control and a colonial past? Second, what efficacy does the framing of Auschwitz sale into heterosexual wedlock as a piece of performance art offer? What context does it engage by doing so? And so following me will be Ivana Dizda. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Malcolm. That was a really insightful response. And those are certainly questions I've been thinking about and will continue to think about and would love to hear more about what you think. Uh, so as Malcolm just said, my name is Ivana Dizda and uh, my work examines the intersection of art, politics, and law. It's my pleasure to respond to Tiana Vujoshevich's essay, Homage to the Sad Space Bitch, Laika Bielka Strielka, a meditation on the dogs that were launched into space by the Soviet space program beginning in the late 1950s. The essay contemplates the relationship between man and space bitch which the author characterizes as one of a kinship. Vujolcevic considers Laika Bielka Stilka, a gendered and colonized subject, as all at once man's distant relative, companion, co-worker, mimic, representative, hero, and sacrificial being. Here's an excerpt from the piece. The launch of the bitch into the heavens overturns the symbolic hierarchies between God, man, and beast. Although plugged, wired, and scarred, it is the bitch that is in the heavens now, not man or God. It is the bitch that was above earth, above humanity, above the toils of the quotidian. It is the bitch that charts new paths for socialist humankind, paths into space, in which a revolutionary postmodern relationship between men, women, and beasts becomes at least symbolically possible. Entering space means entering an era in which the abuse of beastly, feminine, child flesh reached its ultimate hypertech apotheosis, but also an era in which beastly akin came to stand in for man and the fundamental desires that purportedly made him man, in which the beast is subhuman and superhuman at the same time. Reading this text in this peculiar moment, I was struck by the ways Laika's story and space exploration are in a way akin to today's pandemic. As we look back at Laika, the heroic mutt, we come face to face with a viral mutt, an ominous mutation, a breed of impure origin, equally ambitious and even more resilient. Laika orbits the earth as an eternal memory, while COVID-19 orbits the earth as a concrete living threat seeking bodies to colonize. Some 97% of our DNA is obscure to us, a complete unknown, a question to be answered. While the Soviet space project was an exploration of dark matter, of outer space, we continue to investigate the dark matter inside us, to wander through the cosmos within. Much like the case of the zealous space race in the 1950s, today's laboratories compete to produce a sought after vaccine what would be a feat both practical and symbolic. Vojoshevic notes that Laika Bielka Stilka, man's akin, was, quote, closest to a human being in a very literal sense, in that she was by his side. Very recently, proximity acquired a completely new dimension. Closeness has become a source of danger and even death, not to mention taboo. In order to protect ourselves, we opt for distance, remoteness, and isolation. 
but we can't avoid entirely this intruder, this invasive life form that is COVID-19, whose own life depends on its very proximity to man, its unwilling host. Indeed, while the dog is literally by man's side, the virus is literally on man's inside. Just like Laika's spaceship, we harbor living things on a mission to conquer. We are their vessels. Some viruses inject their DNA into humans, so we might say that those who have had the same such virus become more akin to each other. They have a strain of DNA, others don't. COVID doesn't inject its DNA in us, but still those infect infected develop a kinship through a presumed shared immunity. They are the ones who will be able to go out, participate in the economy, and live their lives under a new conceivable class system that appears within the realm of political possibility. Wojciewicz refers to the Soviet's aspirational transcendence of pre-existing boundaries, those related to, say, biology, tradition, and physical laws, which they hoped would produce a new man. Will today's class of immune citizens likewise constitute the production of a new man, more safe, more able, more entitled? Finally, and perhaps most obviously, the mythical Laika floats through outer space, but she is also confined in space. We too have come to know confinement, communicating from afar as we inhabit our lonely vessels. Beyond lies a new kind of outer space where we dodge other life forms for fear of fatal collision. It is up to us to conquer this space again, but some of us, like the innocent Laika, will pay with our lives. And I'd like to introduce Wojciewicz, who will respond to an essay by Andrew Scheinman. Thank you. Thank you, Ivana, for uh, this uh, great um, summary of my piece. Thank you very much, and the comments were fantastic. Uh, I'm Tiana Wojciewicz, and I'm calling in from Vancouver, where I'm starting, um, just starting to work as an assistant professor at the University of British Columbia. I'm a historian of modern architecture and a graduate of MIT. Um, it's a great honor to be uh, in this issue of Thresholds, uh, which uh, is a journal that um, manages uh, not only to um, offer a platform for experimental and alternative uh, genre of writing, but also for writing that uh, questions the status quo in um, scholarship and in the political spectacle that is related uh, to the history of architecture. So uh, the second kind of um, article is the article of Andrew Scheinman, which uh, I'm um, privileged to comment on. Uh, it is uh, Palmyra or Construction of Ruin, uh, in which uh, Scheinman uh, talks uh, about uh, the political uh, scene that um, emerged after the partial um, destruction of um, Palmyra monuments uh, by ISIS. And the kind of kinship he talks about uh, is the kinship that's established once um, the world community um, starts talking uh, about um, this uh, heritage site as uh, the monument that belongs to humanity at large and defines uh, this uh, community uh, of uh, humanity, uh, we as a whole, um, as uh, the community to which monuments belong. And he talks about how in order to define the we, how to in order to define this uh, world uh, community to which heritage belongs, we always have to invent the then, the other. Here it's ISIS, but also historically uh, in the consideration of the Palmyra uh, ensemble, it is the inhabitants of the real uh, town who live there uh, next to what we perceive as just some kind of a monumental ruin. Uh, so I would like to um, I, I would like to read the following excerpt that illustrates this idea the best. So um, uh, Scheinman summarizes his findings in this excerpt. Uh, to decry the destruction at Palmyra is to channel not concern for human culture, but rather the legacy of centuries of romantic Orientalist ruin gazing that made the Middle East little more than a fictive and idyllic cradle of civilization, the past tense counterpart to an enlightened West. Today, the evocation of lost heritage at Palmyra makes the claim that we, ruin gazers, 
are the sole survivors of an entire nation that is no more. And if we, and if the we who survived Palmyra is the same we whose past is their past, then by simple arithmetic, uh, they left undefined yet implicit do not survive. Um, I would like uh, to um, relate um, my excitement about this article uh, with um, a problem that we are currently facing um, uh, with uh, the challenges uh, that come to the teaching of global history in this weird moment. Uh, for the last maybe 10 years, um, as uh, teachers, as of students, we have studied the global history of architecture in an attempt to become global citizens. And this um, enterprise has been uh, spearheaded uh, by MIT, by the Global Architectural History Teaching Collaborative. Now, in the time of coronavirus, we are facing a challenge that's traveling around the world and building this global community is going to be completely impossible. But the second challenge is the challenge uh, that Scheinman points to. If we talk about this global heritage as our heritage and define ourselves as the citizens of the world, whom are we excluded, excluding? And how do we um, resist uh, re excluding uh, populations and creating uh, in some one form or, one or another this uh, oriental or colonized uh, other? Um, what is uh, really important about Shimon's article is that he talks about the real inhabitants of the Palmyra site who are constantly overlooked or erased from uh, the historical uh, heritage in order to make room for establishing Palmyra as the world monument. And I think this uh, kind of gives us a direction in which we can go, um, in which we can resist um, building this uh, other as historians of uh, global architecture by admitting this living presence of people whose idea about what's we and what is uh, global heritage that we're representing uh, might be. And I think these new challenges, the practical challenges to the global historian might actually be very productive um, in, um, in this way. And I, I really thank uh, Scheinman for bringing this to our attention. Uh, so uh, now uh, I would like to uh, announce the FARC, who is going to comment uh, on uh, their own um, the piece. Before, before F Architecture, I think we'll invite Andrew to. Okay, it's just making sure I didn't get that wrong. Comment. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Tiana. Well, thank you. For, thank you, Tiana, for that insightful response. I really appreciate your, your close reading. Uh, so hi, I'm uh, Andrew Scheinman, and uh, I'm also doing from Canada, from Montreal, where I work as an editor at the Canadian Center for Architecture. And I also just last year finished my master's in art design in the public domain at the GSD and was kind of looking forward to being back in Cambridge about now for the launch and to visit. But I guess this postcard of uh, 19th century Cairo, sort of pasted behind me, will do for now. Uh, and that relates to what I'll be reading tonight, which is Nasser Rabat's piece. And I'm sad he couldn't be here. Um, but anyway, before I begin, I also want to quickly thank uh, Sarah Stratton and Dalma and everyone else involved for setting this up. And I also want to thank you and the peer reviewers for giving my writing your care and attention for the last year or so. I really appreciate that. Okay, so uh, Nasser's piece is called Brotherhood of the Towers on the Spatiality of the Mamluk Caste, and it's about the spatiality of the Mamluk Caste of medieval Egypt and Syria. Uh, Mamluk is a term used during that period to designate slaves who are trained to be warriors and might eventually end up as emirs or even sultans, and the word means something like owned one. For some 10 or 12 years of their adolescence, Mamluks would share their master's household and live within an all-male, family-like structure with cl clearly defined hierarchical positions and relationships before being eventually freed as soldiers. The young, Mam the young Mamluk, Nasser writes, uprooted from his family, environment, and culture, must have endured tremendous psychological and emotional pressures. To cope, he had recourse to an artificial kinship construct that mimicked a motherless family structure with father figures and brothers. The brothers, who were called, and I'm surely going to butcher this, 
Kushtashia, a loan term from Persian, which means brothers in arms, were the Mamluks under training who shared the same accommodations. Thus, space was a factor in defining the artificial kinship of the Mamluks along with the circumstances of their enslavement. In fact, it could be asserted that spatial restrictions define not only the movements of the Mamluk as he rose to the stages of the Mamluk hierarchy all the way to the top, but also his identity, social interactions, and military standing. To assert their dominance as a new and distinct ruling class, the Mamluks, with their internal hierarchy made up of layers of artificial kinship, restructured the spaces in which they lived. So Nasser's piece goes on to correlate and compare this abstract familial structure with the palpable and solid structure of the tibax or barracks that housed the Mamluks, focusing specifically on the citadel of Cairo, which is what this is behind me. And it's this mirroring that really interests me here, how the form and layout of the citadel are so rigidly informed by this, in one sense, imaginary, but still all the same powerful social and political construction, and how, in turn, that social hierarchy is determined by its architecture. The spatiality of the Mamluk caste, which Nasser has pieced together from what seems like a very difficult and incomplete array of sources, is the literalization of social order projected onto building. And though it still seems somewhat far off from my own piece on Palmyra, I can't help but see the same sorts of connection between narrative, social construction, image, and building here as in there. It is ultimately the construction of social kinships and the images of place they project themselves onto that more than anything determine what architecture is, what it looks like, and what it becomes. Thanks everyone. And uh, now I want to introduce, uh, now I want to introduce the Feminist Architecture Collaborative. Hello, um, Feminist Architecture Collaborative, or F Architecture is three. Uh, I'm Gabrielle Prince, and also. I'm Rosanna Al Khatib. And I'm Virginia Blatt. Um, we're going to break the pattern and present our own piece, uh, Passport, Belonging, and No Woman's Land, which tries to see how literal blood relations surface in the paternalist structure of the nation state under the terms use sanguinous or right of blood, um, and also reveal how some of the complexities of Arab womanhood are shaped in part by exclusion from the national body. So in 14 of the 22 Arab League member states and 26 nations globally, citizenship is conferred patrilineal, patrilineally, meaning that women in Jordan, Kuwait, and Saudi Arabia, for example, cannot reproduce their Jordanian, Kuwaiti, or Saudi citizenship. Rather, official belonging is constituted through biological fathers, which in turn produces extra citizen categories like the children of Jordanian women who have their own ID card, uh, but limited access to the rights and protections granted to Jordanian nationals. So we looked at how the effects of paternal usanguinous play out through other legal mechanisms, um, those that govern personal status, guardianship, divorce, and custody, and the more slippery indices of social policing, like shame and honor, uh, which concern women's intimate relations to the community. Part of what we discuss looks to Sarah Ahmed's writing on shame as intersubjective, um, but we also refer to the Jordanian sociologist Misoun Alatoum's conception of the collective body, as well as to her ethnographic research on honor killings, which reveal how this um, sort of extreme jurisdiction over women's bodies is sanctioned to different degrees by the immediate community and by the state apparatus. So uh, that will give you some context for the story that opens our piece that Rosanna will read now. Thank you, Gabrielle. So just a disclaimer, um, it's almost 7 p.m. So the pots and pans around the neighborhood are going to start clinking. Um, just a warning of the background noise. Um, okay. My mother told me a story about Nada Sayel. The details that circulate as local legend far exceed the fact of her death. She was killed in 1947, and her story resurfaced with her body in 2010. People still talk about her, swearing that they saw her lifeless figure intact as it was excavated from under the dirt so many years later. She was still warm by some accounts. They say you could almost see her veins underneath the folds of her skin. She had been discarded, thrown in an unmarked pit overgrown with weeds. She was given her father's name, Daughter of Man. 
meaning Sile's daughter disinterred from the earth, disinterred from the earth. In that little Palestinian village, her story served as a cautionary tale for my mother's generations and those who would follow. We have since learned how Nada was murdered by her own brother, Sleiman, under the direction of their father and uncles. To rid the family of her dishonor, in Arabic, or I cleansed myself of her shame. She had gone out with a boy or, has, or was seen being chummy with him. Maybe they had sex. Whatever the accusation, it was enough to deem her a rotten limb who had not just sullied the family's good name, but compromised their bloodline. She'd left them no choice. They had to amputate. The honor killing sanctioned by the patriarchal social order was a permissible extrication. Upon finding Nada's corpse decades later, however, reportedly undecomposed in its grave, she was announced a vestal miracle, exhumed and exculpated. The virgin is vindicated only by the intactness of her body, but Nada remains a victim of social precaution. Her execution was intended to preserve family honor and the moral health of her community, and it continues to, re to enforce the protocols set for female sociality in a story that mothers still tell their daughters. Within a system of justice that still narrowly determines the lives of women between honor and shame, who answers to this violence? Who and what are we to blame? So that's the end of the expert, excerpt. Um, and at this point, it might be good to um, go into Madison Teresa's piece to the extent that it also thinks about violence that is committed out of you, but within the frame of the law. In other words, how border patrol enforces the violent exposure of the migrant um, in the desert borderland. So in the plush that pricks melancholia and kinship in space in between, Madison Treese reviews the project, The Space in Between, by the artist Margarita Cabrera, who works with migrant women to embroider accounts of border crossing onto plush cactus sculptures, replicas of the live cacti that bear witness to treacherous journeys through the Sonoran Desert, a kind of practice of melancholia. In thinking about kin, we want to pick up on the relationship between the cacti and migrants in this excerpt. In Mexican indigenous cosmologies, agave is personified as the deity Mayawel, who represents fertility and the art of weaving. She is also the mother of Zintayatul, a maize deity. Corn is a staple crop and life force, but also the ancestral body. The origin place of humans is therefore non-human. Plants and humans are kin. Not only this, the non-human is animated and endowed with the capacity to move a perspective that persists today. One recent migrant explained, the jumping cactus is as alive as any animal out there. This incomplete historical and cosmological narrative demonstrates not only the ways in which people are linked to the land, but also the ways in which the landscape is alive, can bear witness, and embodies the history, memory, and knowledge of the people who inhabit it or cross through its treachery. In reference to the land-body connection in She Connects Culture, Latinx scholar Laura E. Perez states, our historical relationship to certain places is reflected in specific natural landmarks charged with memory as markers of our identity and that of our ancestors and cared for and respected in parts as such. If melancholy is mourning without memory or the ability to replace the lost object and to be constantly psychically and physically haunted, it is only with the cacti that the racial melancholy of migrants experience can be worked through. Um, end of excerpt. So reading this piece, we were struck by this melancholic practice that dwells on the relationship between bodies in the landscape, both the cactus and the migrant, and what we found to be this kind of ghost lingering in the background. What structures the violence of being rooted through the desert is the infrastructure of the border involving border patrol. So the uniform appears as a part of the material substrate for what the act of weaving joins together in the artist's work. The scene the cactus witness, the event the migrants experience, and evidence of the apparatus of governance that perpetuated the violence. So order architecture is usually the visual symbol of this violence and it too is absent here. Although we might think of that um, as a reprieve, I think, given that social practice and architecture tends to handle 
uh, border architecture poorly by trivializing it and not identifying it as the territory of racialized policing that it is. I'm thinking of the border seesaw project we saw last year. Um, and in that sense, uh, I think racial melancholia is a really insightful conceptual frame for this practice because it captures um, both the effective dimension of the violence of the border, something that's carried beyond crossing, um, but also one of resistance, of refusing to forget. Um, given the emphasis on racial melancholia as legible or illegible to white empathy, we were left wondering who the audience is for an art practice that seems to be more interested um, perhaps in the expression and performative remembrance of that pain. In other words, the very act of embroidering. So maybe one question to leave this piece on is uh, how is the art public viewing this work implicated in this kind of dynamic of witnessing? And then we'll turn it over to you, Madison. Thank you. I'm like frantically trying to write down your question, but I'm sure I can get it from you at some other time. Um, I really appreciate that reading and your guys' feedback. Um, let me pull up my notes really fast. So um, as I mentioned, my name is Madison Treese. I am a PhD candidate in visual studies at the University of California in Santa Cruz. And tonight I am going to be introducing um, the work, the paper, The Relocation of Indigenous Community of South Indian Lake, 1966-68, to 68, for an Alternative and Shared Inhabitation of Modern Architectural History, and this is by Dr. Eliza Dionese. So Dr. Dionese's piece examines urban planner and architects Blanche Lemko Van Ginkel and Daniel Van Ginkel's study on the relocation of several indigenous communities in northern Canada, including the group of South Indian Lake. This group would be displaced to transform Lake Winnipeg into a hydraulic power plant. Her essay takes a nuanced approach to understanding the Van Ginkel's attempt to balance responsibility to the government who favored assimilation with their own desire to include indigenous communities in the design process. While their work was pioneering and critiqued established norms around indigenous relocation, they still operated as an arm of state authority. So the excerpt I'm going to read um, goes thus, quote, confirming the desire of the architects to establish a reliable exchange after initial meetings, the Van Ginkels wrote, quote, everybody who has moved, reserves or urban renewal, feels they are being punched around without participation and without contributing knowledge of the North, end quote. Such an assertion challenged the mainstream top-down model of the delivery of design expertise that presupposed design know-how to originate with the designer and proceeded Un unidirectionally to the recipient. However, despite the fact that the Van Ginkels demonstrated awareness of the need for indigenous representation in relocation strategies, at times the design group upheld hierarchical, hierarchical relations within the community. She continues, while indigenous groups have the right to decide where to settle in established towns, new communities, the natural environment, or near places of employment, only designers were supposed to be responsible for guiding resettlement in new communities. This approach dismissed the opportunity of significant divergent opinions and ethical perspectives in the process while triggering results that were opposite to what Lemko probably desired to achieve. And that's the end of the um, excerpt. So um, regardless that the belief that the people of South Indian Lake should be able to decide their own future uh, was the first real moment, sorry. So regardless of the fact that it didn't necessarily um, work out that they were able to work in with the indigenous community um, on this project, the belief that they even should be in charge of deciding their own future was a first real moment of exchange that um, existed during this period and in this project. So I really appreciated Dr. Dainese's critical approach to what was um, in a manner that was able to both appreciate the strides that the Van Ginkels made while also being aware of its shortcomings as a governmental relocation project. And the project's timeline, 1966 to 69, feels uncomfortably contemporary. And while we don't know whether their vision of shared dialogue among designers, communities, and the government would have been helpful, and this is something that she acknowledges because 
um, inevitably the project wasn't seen through. I would be curious to know if these principles have had any impact on more recent resource development and extraction projects. As we know that governments and institutions continue on these types of endeavors, we look to Mauna Kea, Herastic, Standing Rock, and many, many more. So for this reason, the piece feels relevant, informative, but also leaves me questioning what can or should be shared. And with that, I am going to pass it on to um, Dr. Dionese. Thanks. Thanks, Madison. Uh, yeah. Um, I, hello? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, OK. Can you see me? <laughs> no? Well, I don't know why. <laughs> uh, yes, can? we can. Don't worry. It, it, yeah. OK, it's perfect. Good. Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, so thanks, Madison, for your comments and actually for your questions. Um, I, I don't uh, I have a precise answer. It's a very, very complicated um, issue. Uh, but we can discuss about this later. Uh, so I would, lo would also like to thank Dalma, Sarah, and Stratum for the work done uh, these past months. It's been great uh, working with you. So. Um, yeah, Madison, Madison introduced me. I'm Elisa Dainese. I'm a historian, a theorist of architecture and urbanism. Uh, my work examines intersections between globalization, decolonization, and modernism, with a specific focus on the knowledge exchange between America, Europe, and Africa. Uh, this evening, I present uh, an excerpt from uh, Sabrina Chu's essay, manifesto, entitled uh, Light Tenders, an Incomplete theory of social digestion. So the manifesto ends the issue 48 of thresholds. It's a concluded response to the editorial proposal for uh, rethinking the boundaries, the substances, the architectures of kinship. Sabrina proposes um, a very interesting lens, the lens of digestion, to rebase the um, uh, Im imaginary of the making of kin relations. So um, at page 183, Sabrina uh, affirms, uh, in offering ourselves up and consuming each other, we might begin to understand the outside world as part of us and ourselves as part of it. Everything is everything. What gets spit or shut out? Understanding my stomach as your gut or your gut as my shit or their shit as part of our scrambled ecosystem allows us to reimagine how we relate to one another. Part of ourselves and even our ingestion become shared, up for grabs, and out of our own control. Consuming each other thus becomes a process of making public our faculties. Um, later in the text, um, and this is page 184, um, Sabrina ex explains uh, this concept further. This shared digestion, and I'm, I'm quoting, attempts to defy a paradigm of consumption that is conflated with possessing. If in consuming, we destroy and digest uh, what it is that we, that we encounter, sorry, it means that we no longer have it. Instead, it has become a part of us. And after, what we don't incorporate, leftover crumbs, what's wasted, discarded, can be offered up once more tender to a public stomach. The social space of shared digestion is one that invites collective desire, collective consumption, collective metabolism, and collective embodiment. Wow, so uh, I share with Sabrina the interest in, in this idea of consumption from a sort of anthropophagic uh, point of view. To consume means to eat the other, even to ingest something that at first might seem incompatible to one's own cultural milieu. And I'm especially interested in it as an active way of breaking down, reinvesting the power of the consumer with a new potency. I also hesitate to use the term consumption, I have to admit. Uh, often in my work, I have to deal with the search for authenticity, for example. So what is authentically indigenous? Um, as Madison said in my article, I discuss um, 
about this, uh, I discuss about the, the construction of the image of the Canadian North, the indigenous can, in Canada. It is within um, the act of consuming that we can overcome this search for authenticity where nothing changes. So to consume is in a way to challenge authenticity. Sabrina investigates also consumption as a uh, relational process. So she affirms that to attend, and I quote, um, to a bodily dimension of relating to others, um, is can be a way to recompose ourselves in relation to what and who are around us. And this is page 178. So we are indeed consuming everything around us, local beings, global systems, uh, the outbreak uh, is evidence of this. Um, but if consuming is taken together, and again, Sabrina explains, it, it comes from Latin, uh, con meaning together, and sumere meaning to take. So if consuming is taking together, we can understand it as sharing, but only when the act of consuming, of metabolizing works equally in both directions. So I consume you, you consume me in a way. Um, history, the history of colonization, settler colonialism, for example, they show that digestion has often appeared as a violent uh, unidirectional process. So consuming can, uh, can be about transforming others into ourselves. Uh, it can be about giving up ourselves to become more alike. So to unpack the act of, comp of, of consuming means to investigate relations as well as overlapping uh, interdependencies to uncover, among others, narratives of marginalization and otherization. So narratives that I tried to investigate, for example, in my article introduced by Madison. Um, in this case, consumption tells the story of an assault on indigenous uh, sovereignties perpetuated by settler colonialism, um, assimilationist policies, modernizing plans, shaping native, native as well as non-native lives. Um, the risk of focusing on singularities, on the bodily dimension of consumption is probably to lose pers perspective on this asymmetry of relations, being them power relations, economic relations, social relations, etc. Um, to, to lose perspective on their intersectionality. So time and space can be inhabited as a communal experience. Um, and this implies a qualitative shift of recognition of all narratives, especially those labeled as minor narratives. So a very interesting piece, and I really thank Sabrina for her work. It's a sort of um, a call to arms uh, a piece that I would definitely recommend to read. And uh, yeah, Sabrina, your turn. Thank you so much for your reading and your response. Um, it's very thoughtful and rich. And um, I think it's great because I can keep thinking through that. Um, I also wanted to thank um, Sarah Dalman Stratton for making space in the journal for uh, this kind of writing and um, the past uh, months of working together. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm Sabrina Cho. I'm an artist and I'm also a doctoral candidate at the University of Oxford in art practice. And I'll be reading from Nana Last's text Thomas Struth's Bodies of Work, which maps out a lineage of Thomas Struth's multi-genre photographic work that includes empty streetscapes, family portraits, sites of science and technology, surgical setups, humanoid robots, and deceased animals to bring to light questions around subjectivity, resemblance, forms of intelligence, and how reconsidering viewing and viewership dislocates how we relate within a wider field of subjects and objects. I'll begin by reading from a section that follows a description of a photograph from Stroot's IZW series 
where he has photographed dead animals in the Leibniz Institute for Zoo and Wildlife Research, which studies the impact of humans on the environment. One photograph, Gahir and Encephalon, which is um, my backdrop here, is of a bloody close-up of an animal's brain that has been extracted for examination. Um, and I'll be reading two sections that follow the discussion around that photograph. In instigating these connections, Gahir and Encephalon reaches beyond the confines of a given in series to find echoes of itself in various guises throughout Struth's body of work. In this manner, the IZW series galvanizes multiple strains of images that surpass forms of resemblance based on Kin's traditional blood and legal ties to posit complex alliances, both cross species and via intelligent machines. These affiliations traverse biological, environmental, and scientific domains, weaving visible lineages that generate a spectrum of the modes, extents, and possibilities for forming human kinship. The animal brain depicted in Gehern and Cephalon joins with figures, heads, and other body parts in visualizing an array of characteristic human traits such as consciousness, cognition, and sentience to link individuals who face the camera at one end of an unfolding spectrum to their technological counterparts with humanoid robots and polymer heads at the other. And um, to continue, as distinctions between what is and what is not kin are drawn and imagined, produced and legitimized, art's potential to offer previously unseen images allows alternate terrains of association to come forth as relevant, whether aesthetic, legal, technological, technological or environmental. Struth's resulting body of work in accumulating these collective subjects rather than answering those questions lays the ground for complex and competing principles and venues of kinship. Those subjects, processes, and sites lead us to probe where and how such distinctions are conceived and performed. This would allow kinship to come about not through a fixed and assumed set of assumptions, but with the conscious creation and questioning of existing associations. The question of agency and its embodiment situated between animate and inanimate, human and robot, polymer heads and family portraits, subject and object viewed and viewing, cannot help but disturb any conviction that those distinctions are settled. Um, what I found particularly resonant in this text is the notion of embodiment, which is something my work is very much invested in, and how through this examination of Thomas Struth's work, embodiment becomes expanded alongside expanded practices of looking, categorizing, and knowledge making. The question of what constitutes a body, both of artwork, but also what is a body, singular or collective, that's worthy of attribution, recognition, and relation. Um, we're in a time now where um, our sort of bodily and embodied practices and experiences are really um, strange, different, unusual. Um, and also where the way we relate to the outside world or to others is spatially limited. It's actually bound by a viewing box, a Zoom or Skype or Teams window, a screen, in other words, a photographic frame. And I think it's all too easy to slip, especially now into habitual modes of seeing and thinking. Um, this text has been a stark reminder that it's absolutely necessary to break this kind of restrictive viewing, to disturb these modes, and as Nana Last writes, to disturb the conviction that distinctions, and I would add relations, are resolved. Okay, well, that brings us um, to a full circle, kind of loopy circle. Um, thank you, everyone, for this sampling. Um, and hopefully now everyone is intrigued and ready to dive into the full issue. Um, we've prepared a few questions. I think we have about 
maybe a half hour left, but we can see how <laughs> how long we can um, sustain this. Um, we're also collecting questions from the audience through the webcast platform, but anything that goes unanswered, unanswered here, um, we'll try to fold into continuing conversations on other platforms um, in the following weeks or months. Um, and we also want to make a plug for um, the next issue of Thresholds, if Thresholds 49s apply. The um, submission uh, due date is June 1st. And I'm sure we're all in some way <laughs> thinking about supply right now. So um, yeah, we're excited to see where that goes. Um, so in our introduction, um, we argue for the continuing importance of works um, that address and seek to sort of establish relationships with the other or to sort of question um, these longstanding um, uh, traditions of uh, defining an other. Um, so many entries could be read in the, in the issue as cautionary tales um, of this kind of epistemic impulse of getting to know the other. Um, and we can maybe see that in the case of Palmyra, the sort of Euro European quest for a definitive essence of that place, or um, in the work um, in the Canadian North, um, in Elisa's piece, um, and the involvement of an indigenous community there, the difficulties um, with uh, working between um, the interests of a government and um, the needs uh, of the indigenous communities in that area. Um, so these pieces detail the shortcomings, um, like I said, of this epistemic project. Um, the legacies of colonization that structure nearly any sort of transcultural or transsubjective encounter um, as a sort of concern for scholarship. Um, so, and, and this is, we can think about this as particularly maybe relevant for um, the discipline of architecture. We want to like call that out specifically as um, a discipline that has historically overlooked the sort of ethical stakes or implications of its interventions, particularly um, in uh, non um, Eurocentric uh, positions. So, okay, so basically, what we're just, it's a sort of an invitation for you all um, to share a bit about um, ways of working, whether flawed, you know, or um, offering an alternative that you have encountered and learned from, um, and, and what dilemmas either of trust, of credit, of representation have surfaced from the archives you, you've investigated, from your conversations in your practice or in the practices you've studied, um, or in your own writing. So, you know, at, I think anyone could probably respond to this, but we were thinking of, you know, um, when we were sort of formulating this question, we were thinking about, um, Elisa, your work on um, the indigenous communities of the Canadian North, um, and Irene, um, your work on these uh, long standing practices of the Laku. Um, and Tiago, I think you could also probably speak to this, of the people of the um, Yanomami. Um, but of course, if anyone else wants to jump in, um, feel free. Yeah, if, if I may, um, it's um, curious the fact that you mentioned the archive. I'm Elisa, okay. um, I, I wrote on the indigenous communities. Um, of uh, South Indian Lake. Um, as I said, it's, it's uh, important that you mentioned the, the archive because this, um, this piece, this research started at the uh, Canadian Center of Architecture in Montreal, a, a, an important uh, North American archive. 
um, while I was studying uh, the work of uh, uh, Blanche Linko and Daniel Van Ginkel, so these two uh, modern architects and planners. And um, while for other projects, uh, they, they uh, were very famous and uh, um, very fortunate in their work, um, so very successful, um, while for other projects for the city, for example, of, of Montreal or um, other important uh, um, buildings and, and urban plan, uh, there are, uh, there's a lot of material, um, even a, a lot of material that I collected about uh, the reaction um, of, of people uh, to their projects. Uh, there is not that much on, on this specific project of relocation in, in the north. Um, it was very difficult, for example, to um, recollect uh, um, details about uh, uh, interviews that uh, they had with the indigenous community um, to understand how they decided uh, to work with the community, what was the method that they tried to develop in order to communicate their ideas and to share their knowledge with, with the community. Um, so uh, many times at, at the archive, I was looking for specific documents, but uh, several times uh, what I was able to find were only uh, empty folders stating that the material was still very sensitive and uh, uh, was not possible to actually access uh, those paperwork, those documents. So um, to, to go back to your uh, question about the encounter with no neurocentric tradition, well, it's, uh, it, it can be tackled from many perspectives. Um, for sure, there is a problem of accessibility um, of resources. Even when we, as historian, we try to trace back and uh, uh, retell this kind of stories and narratives. Tiago, I don't know if you if you wanna. Yes, I, I can speak. I was just waiting to see if Irene would like to speak first, but I can make a few commentary about your question. Uh, this question is very important for me, I think, because it's it's maybe a, a way to to frame my practice, at least currently. Uh, I am. As I said, and as Emily also presented me, I am an architect and also an anthropologist. Uh, and since when I, I started working and studying and thinking together with indigenous people here in Brazil, uh, this, this encounter with the other, as you said, was a really, hard thing to follow, I think, because really architecture, uh, especially the way it's, it's uh, practiced here in Brazil, really don't look <laughs> to the others, and especially indigenous people, in my opinion. And here in Brazil have a, a really complexity of multiple uh, people and multiple thoughts in the same territory, we have more than 150 languages being spoken in the country. Uh, so to me, this is a real uh, challenge. And at this moment, my research is exactly to, to think with the Yanomami people in the Amazon uh, and to learn with them their own uh, conception of architecture. Uh, which is, of course, a kind of uh, epistemic invention, uh, as it is rooted in an effort of a translation. Uh, and I'm, I am working uh, in this research with uh, the ethnographical framework and also methodology, methodological brackets. So, 
this 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 question of dealing with no non eurocentric uh, ways of of thinking it's completely central to me and i think really a a practice that should be more present in our faculties and in colleges and research teams i think that's it Okay, I'll take a stab. I mean, I feel like there's a lot of different ways um, to come into this question. Um, one, just kind of beginning where, with the thought that Tiago left me with, is that um, one of the things that I, I'm working through in the larger dissertation project, but also in this article, is, is how to really talk about architectural practice and Haiti as a, as a product of creolization, which means that it's not simply, or let's skip the word simple, but that we're not <laughs> looking at a um, <laughs> something outside of a Euro uh, a Eurocentric history or a or a West you know a Western world history, but something which is which is completely part of um, of Western history, but also inclusive of knowledges. That were indigenous, that were displaced um, from Africa through the transatlantic slave trade, they've all come together into this really complex um, being, and that are not frozen in time in any way. So that the subject of this piece, you know, one, the framing is discussing this idea of la coup, which was really a dominant um, sort of spatial practice from the 19th century, but that in the 20th century, you know, an architect trained um, in Puerto Rico. Um, who spent time in the United States and Mexico is working with his, you know, wife who's an anthropologist trained in the United States and at Tufts in Boston, you know, to create this um, sort of nearly a utopian or sort of an imaginative solution to to collective dwelling and in their contemporary moment, and so it just requires, I think, um, a constant, a constant battle to like destabilize um, the assumed binaries or the assumed conflicts between different sort of worldviews and different forms of knowledge. And a whole bunch of other things that have just gone out of my head. I don't know if there's anyone else that wants to chime in. Um, I don't know if, if Andrew, like, if, I mean, I, I know that most of your, the work for this piece was um, archival or bibliographic and like sleuthing the sort of media landscape. Um, but I don't know, do you have, do you have thoughts on, on the way that that whole sort of media apparatus works in a similar way to this earlier um, appropriation of Palmyra as a sort of, as a, like a false authentic uh, image. I don't know if you have thoughts. Um, I don't know if I know how to speak to that exactly, but I, I will say that one thing that came up over and over again as I was um, writing this and doing this research is that a lot of the a lot of the ways that I could find out more about um, the history of Palmyra or about um, its populations or its it, it, all of this information came through the same sources that I also was critical of, and it, I found it very hard to get around that. And there was sort of this epistemological sort of paradox that the very same lenses by which I was discovering in a sense about Palmyra, at least personally, were the same that I could also see as being wholly jaded from the beginning. And I think one of the reasons that this piece speaks pretty directly only to um, the same sort of contemporary media, like it, it, my, my critique is directed maybe at like various writers in 2016, 2017, and it, I use information from 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 the 17th century and 18th century to sort of build the connection between these two things, but I don't know how to speak necessarily to the population 
uh, in Palmyra and Syria, aside from the acknowledgement that they exist because that archival material uh, doesn't really compare in weight or in value in a certain sense to the sort of narratives that were eventually written about it. And it's that kind of disjuncture that made that narrative so powerful. And so it's so capable of erasing the local population. So we have we have another question um, we would like to throw throw out to the group, in and this begins with in a recent compilation by the L.A. Review of Books, A. L. Wiseman wrote, "To a great extent, the history of architecture is an attempt to control contamination and its more or less subtle racial coatings." Um, we wanted to to throw generally out. Um, a question about how art and architecture are implicated in producing and sustaining containments and separation, whether these be political, spatial, or social. Um, we're very keenly aware of it in this moment of COVID-19 and, and aware of the racist imagination, to borrow AL's term, of pandemic management and architecture that provides in some senses, a containment. Um, so when we were crafting this question, we were thinking maybe more specifically to, to put the light on certain people, um, uh, Rio's, Rio's work, Ivana's work, Yvonne's work, also Madison um, and F. Arc, speaking to, I guess, all different scales of um, containment if anyone would be interested in riffing off of that. I'm not sure if I can speak necessarily about containment, but I think in my own work, and maybe to connect to this idea of uh, writing failure or methodology. Um, since starting at Columbia, one of my advisors, Mabel Wilson, has been very good at uh, getting me to not stretch the metaphor of what constitutes this architecture, at least historically, and see it as something that emerges in Western society um, aligned with certain access to power, property, Etc. And so when thinking about ballroom and trying to situate ballroom, I mean, it was very hard to argue in the beginning that this was a form of architecture because there was no formal tectonics, there was no building involved, it was predominantly the embodiment and performance of space. Um, and I think uh, maybe trying to connect to containment, that's one of the ways in which I think the discipline itself disacknowledges or removes certain forms of spatial embodiment or what could be stretched as architecture aside and has a very strong definition of what could count as a architectural thesis or dissertation. Um, I myself uh, writing about ballroom pretty much as an outsider coming in also kind of learn the trouble of coming from a certain discipline with certain expectations about what would be archived or considered. Uh, ballroom is a history predominantly of, 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 of oral history, um, not a official written history beyond Jenny Livingston's film, which itself has many problems and editorial choices. Uh, and I think in that experience, it really opened up how limited my vocabulary was in even trying to both push against the, the uh, expectations of a thesis while also being um, not coherent, but uh, being aware of how I was writing and possibly reinscribing or recontaining ideas and notions of architecture when approaching this community. And I, my last footnote very much speaks upon that. It's a very long footnote, um, but it was to acknowledge that this was very much a co-productive thesis that it was I was not able to do it without the kind of open arms of some ballroom members and 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 our interviews um, yeah yeah uh, well I think that this is actually a fantastic question and uh, that really speaks volumes about our 
everyday life right now for everybody under this uh, corona uh, regime, let's say, but that it has been the uh, everyday life of uh, so many other people for uh, so long. It's actually very much related to the excerpt that Ben and Sebastian uh, were reading about uh, my essay precisely, because uh, this idea of containment sometimes is um, a sceptical way or a way of actually talking about uh, segregation or gettification of certain kind of population that uh, are marginalized precisely because of their uh, sometimes their health status or the times because of their bodies themselves or uh, uh, sometimes because of their um, a migrant condition, uh, let's say. I think that uh, for me what it was important uh, in this piece, but also in my work in general, is how can we find ways of um, redefine the idea of uh, health in a way and uh, of staying with the trouble, a la Donna Haraway, let's say, and uh, how can we deal with other definitions of uh, bodies, of, um, uh, let's say, health, uh, in a way. But also, at the same time, how uh, we are not only humans, in a way, and that we are uh, borders, uh, we, we inhabit borders themselves, and we inhabit uh, ideological regimes, and that we have to recognize also uh, other voices, other bodies, uh, other forms of uh, kinship in order to reconstruct uh, architecture as a discipline and uh, how uh, can we also, uh, how can this also lead us to other traditions, other genealogies in order to form another process, uh, other processes of emancipation in a way. Yeah. Um, I can comment as well. So you mentioned contamination and containment. And I think these are two things that are often, if not inevitably linked to one another. It's true in the European Union, migrants and definitely refugees are often seen as a vi you could say a virus, a disease, a contaminating force, which often leads to containment. It's not exclusive to the EU, of course. In the US, we see it with migrants crossing the borders and children ending up locked in cages in the EU. A lot of migrants and refugees end up in migrant detention centers where they are tortured and abused. So these two things, containment and uh, contamination, are, are always linked, I think. And the hope is that works of art can not only draw attention to this, but also um, perhaps ideal, idealistically, um, perhaps I'm saying this idealistically, but mobilize people in order to actually do something about it. On the other hand, there's always a risk that an artwork that is bold and controversial will unwittingly contribute to some of the stereotypes that um, enable people to think a certain way about migrants and refugees. And this is something that I often think about. And I always um, try to see a work uh, from, from both angles. I can, I can kind of jump in here and respond to that. Um, Cause I really like what Ivana said. And I think that containment such as prevention through deterrence which you know places so many boundaries along the border that forces people through a very dangerous part of the desert is um, a kind of containment that not only is deadly but renders so many um, migrants and their experiences invisible. So how can these artworks try to push against that sense of invisibility? And as I was kind of thinking about this question that you're asking in containment, I, I started, started thinking about the implications of containing these narratives in a new form of the gallery space and how that might also be limiting 
Um, and I like to think about a more optimistic view, especially with the space in between, is that it does travel and move throughout the country. So it it brings in this type of um, movement that would be denied otherwise to migrants living in the U.S. Um, but that's a very compelling question. I'm, I'm happy that I get to think about this more. Um, thanks. And I might jump in and just add, um, I'm thinking about in Julia Chris Davis theory of the abject and thinking back to sort of the Weizmann quote that Sarah brought up. Um, she says that the abject, or you might sub in the disgusting as a synonym, um, is that which disturbs borders or systems or rules. Um, and she says it's that which is cast off. So like long hair might be considered beautiful, but then if you cut it off and it's on the floor, then it's kind of gross. Um, so yeah, we might say that the like building of a wall or the creation of a border is what creates uh, the disgusting and the not or the contamination and the, the contained. And I just wanna shortly add, you know, having thought a little bit more about your question, that ballroom, one of the things I love about ballroom is that it tries to subvert that level of containment. It shows how space is malleable. Some of the tactics of early ballroom were actually meant in a way to contain that fabulosity, uh, but, not, but not in the same sense, like in order to produce what we would consider a safe space because that space wasn't given due to urban regimes of enclosure. Um, and what I think is beautiful about ballroom is that despite some of its spatial tactics to ensure its viability, it ends up being completely uncontained towards the end of the 80s and 90s, and in a way becomes not just a dance move uh, or a, a, a genre of dance, but itself pop culture for quite a while, uh, especially in Paradise Garage or Paradise Gay Rage. So to follow up to our question um, about this exclusionary nature of containment and spatial practice, we actually wanted to point out that your research often speaks to how resilient groups have formed communities of care um, and alternative social structures, just like how you, you said, Leo, in the face of these dominant structures that are oppressive or discriminating or negligent, um, better through rethinking collective dwelling or forming chosen families um, in clubs or houses or subverting surveillance apps, for example, in F Architecture's piece. Um, and if anyone wants to comment further um, on this, you're more than welcome to. We also wanted to refer to another really interesting read in um, the same um, LA Review of Books publication, Quarantine Files by Eugene Thacker, who writes, above us, the light speed of algorithmic networks, and below us, the recombinant speed of viral contagion a biological network that is inseparable from an informatic network. Um, and a lot of you also speak to this question of the non-human and how we're so deeply entangled um, with other subjectivities. Um, so Nana, you discussed this um, throughout the work of um, Thomas Truth and Emily, you also already touched on this. Um, and we wanted to um, come back to some points that you already raised during the, the five minute readings. Um, maybe of even relating this to our current situation. Um, if, if you had any further comments on this question of the non-human, whether viral or animal. I mean, just one cool thing that's happening right now is um, all the meat plants are just shutting down out of necessity. And so, like whether people want to or not, they have to think about um, life without meat. And it's also, I think it's cool that it's coinciding with a time when we're all home and cooking a lot because um, it's so easy. And I've totally thought this way that like, oh, um, you know, if you have a burger and you take the meat off, then the burger sucks. But there are totally meals that are not based around meat that are good and exciting. It's just um, a sort of a reframing it's like a creative challenge to to make different foods and yeah so I'm hopeful that that could be a thing that carries into the future 
Yeah, I just wanted to say a couple of things. One is just they're, they're, they're sort of distinct, but one is I just so appreciated when Sabrina had the images of Struth behind her. And at one point she had the one of the, of the um, humanoid robot in, in his space, its space. Um, and which took me a while to even realize it was the image behind her. And then it, then you also had the one of the brain and, and how you as an image of a person fit into either of those situations, I thought was really interesting. Like it, it, it changed you, but it, but you also worked with both. So, I mean, that was always something that interested me, but towards this other current, the current situation and, and, um, of, I, I, I think a lot about viruses right now and, and how much they're alive and not alive. And the debate about them, I think, is really interesting about whether you consider it an alive thing or not, because it can't reproduce on its own um, and therefore creates this association, um, which is just some whole other interesting thing. But when you think about it in terms of kin, you don't even know where that places it, right? Because it's it's... It's, it's this thing that wants to be outside of that thing we think of as life, but also is very much dependent upon it. So that's just throwing out a thought there. I think we have about four minutes remaining and we also wanted to invite you to ask any um, lingering questions to the other authors. And we're so happy that you, you all couldn't make it. If you have any questions to each other, please feel free to ask. Well, I guess um, thank you all for bearing with us with the awkward Zoom format. I know that sometimes it's difficult when you feel like you're talking into a void, like the late night TV hosts that no longer have um, audience responses. And we're, we're very happy that we were able to have everyone here, um, even, even in this digital format. And I guess once again, we'd like to put in a plug for submissions to Thresholds 49 Supply um, and the wonderful editors who will be running that issue. Um, we, we do have one question in the, the Q and A. Should we, should we take it up? I mean, maybe just briefly. Um, Happy Earth Bitch asks, um, can someone comment on why the West, white, always use happiness as promise to universalize and suppress the others? I'm not, like, I, I'm not sh quite sure um, about the, the exact intent of this, but I think it is, it does bring up sort of um, the promise of a good life and whatever that entails um, that, it seems like sort of traditionally kinship has um, been promised as uh, like the, the vehicle towards which one might arrive at a happy, stable um, life. Um, and of course, I think we, this, all of these presentations have sort of been showing the difficulties, the sort of, um, the, the violence that's latent in the construction of family um, and that kinships in so many ways also bring uh, uh, great difficulty. Um, I don't know if there's anyone that wants to comment on happiness, the pursuit of happiness uh, as related to kin. I mean, I guess one way it came up in what I was working through that I'll touch on really briefly was uh, there was one PETA ad that said like got autism spelled out in Cheerios on a bowl of milk and uh, it was 
citing like now defunct research that uh, dairy consumption and autism are linked, but implicit besides the fact that that research is um, considered not valid, um, it uh, assumed that like, you know, to be autistic is this horrible, tragic thing where a lot of people don't with autism don't necessarily feel that way about themselves. So it's assuming, oh, you live a life different than me, that must be so tragic, which is often just not the case. And I think it could apply um, in so many other scenarios. Mm -hmm. I mean, as a short response, I think some of the critiques within Afro-pessimism might also point to the overvaluation of happiness, especially the overvaluation of life within a lot of humanist discourse. This semester, I took a course with Sadia Hartman who really opened up my eyes to some Afro-pessimistic thought. And I think um, it comes from the overvaluation or what Sylvia Winters would say, the overrepresentation of man and the humanism that goes with that. Um, it's very hard to like argue against certain humanistic values, even when those values are against certain people living, right? I think the essay that I pointed, um, not pointed out, the essay that I reviewed very much talks about that contradiction of EU migratory control, that it purports humanistic values while also excluding certain humans from integrating. And that itself um, is guised by this rhetoric of humanism, of life, of valuing life. Um, but in short, I think like Afro-pessimism, <laughs> go check it out. Yeah, totally. As a quick uh, add-on to what you just said, Malcolm, the European Union views and represents the sol itself as a family where the ideal citizen is civilized and wealthy and white and happy. And so if you manage to get there, it's like the European dream. You can become more of all those things. Um, I think I'll leave it there, but so. Uh, it's a, it's a very complex thing. Um, if I could just add, um, I guess one of the things I was interested in and which I think Elisa, you touched on is, is the violence of relating. And um, I guess I was also interested in trying to resist or challenge the notion that kinship um, and relating to others is necessarily a positive uh, experience. So I think um, I was interested in kind of thinking about the, the, the violence inherent in how we form relations. Um, I wanted to say something not related to our um, of architectures piece, but um, thinking about the ways that um, this concept of the good has been mobilized in Ecuador, looking at the constitution, which was the first in the world to ratify the rights of nature. Um, so there was a claim made by the Ecuadorian government that the Quichua term Sumac Kalsai could be utilized in order to paint an image of a nation that would um, have Buen Vivir or the good life. Um, but then it was found that there was not really a push from indigenous peoples to even incorporate this term into the government framework, but rather it came um, from um, the Spanish, more Spanish um, government. And then also that there was a company that was hired from the US to actually write these laws. So I think there's this presumed idea that the good is universal that um, can be mobilized um, against other actors, even within this frame of the law, even in relation to indigenous language. So this gap in translation was kind of exploited to create a framework that edited out agency and as Sabrina was talking about, even the violence that was a part of the indigenous understanding of Sumac Kalsai. Um, so it's just an interesting case to look at that's extremely complicated because of the ways that they covered up the kind of origins of that movement. And then really quickly, I think Stratton, maybe you mentioned a move to completeness and um, just thinking again on the mobilization of the good 
this semester, a student talked about how the wound is productive. I think also questioning the way in which humanism, positive discourse, fulfills a promise of being complete, um, how that tends to move towards a particular worldview, uh, uh, negates the fact that wounds are productive. Now, that isn't to say that we need to idolize pain in wounds, but that wounds do produce knowledge of, of the human and the human plus. Um, Okay, well, I think we're a little bit over time, technically, so I think we should um, end this and allow ourselves to, to get up and move around. Um, so thank you all so much for um, joining us and staying here um, and listening. It's been, it's been really nice. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for all your work on the issue. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>